Okay. Thank you. We will now resume the City Council's hearings on the Mayor's Executive Budget for Fiscal 19. The Finance Committee is joined by the Committee on Governmental Operations, chaired by Councilmember Fernando Cabrera. We've been joined by Councilmember Yeager, Councilmember Kalos, Majority Leader Lori Cumbo, and Councilmember Adrian Adams. Um, and uh, we just heard from the Board of Elections, and now we'll hear from Amy Lopress, Executive Director of the Campaign Finance Board. In the interest of time, I will forego making an opening statement, as will Council Member uh, and Chair uh, Cabrera. And uh, so, Ms. Lopez, we just need to swear you in, and uh, then you can begin your testimony. Okay. Can you hear me? I'm sorry. Okay. It's the red light. Red is on. Yeah. Okay. I, I just am short. Sorry. Um, uh, just have to swear you in. Um, Ms. Lopez, we just have to swear you in. Oh, sorry. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? Yes. Good afternoon, Chair Cabrera and Drum and members of the committee. Um, I am Amy Lopress, the Executive Director of the New York City Campaign Finance Board. With me today is Eric Friedman, our Assistant Executive Director for Public Affairs. I want to thank you for the opportunity to lay out the CFB's budget for fiscal year 2019 and to answer any questions you may have. The CFC's budget of $20.6 million is $36 million lower than in 2018. Most of that amount comes from reductions in our budget for the New York City Campaign Finance Fund and the Voter Guide. Excluding those items, however, the agency has reduced its day-to-day -day operating expenses by 1.2% compared to fiscal year 2018. This reflects the board's real commitment to controlling costs in a non-city election year, while also fulfilling our mandate to engage all New Yorkers in the electoral process. I will provide details on our budget in just a moment, but first I want to update you on the CFB's activities and the role the agency has played in the ongoing national discussion about campaign finance reform in the past year. Over the 30-year history of New York City Matching Funds program, the City Council has routinely worked with the Board to craft legislation that has made our Matching Funds program into a nationally recognized model. I'm happy to report that there has been a sharp increase in successful reform efforts around the country that take their inspiration from our program. In Montgomery County, Maryland, 20 candidates have already received nearly $3 million in matching funds in a new program that is explicitly modeled on ours. The program includes some interesting tweaks that will be worth watching as voters head to the polls for the first publicly funded primary election next month. In Washington, D.C., the City Council passed and Mayor, Mur Mayor Muriel Bowser signed into law a matching fund system that will be in place for the 2020 elections. Closer to home, Suffolk County passed a matching funds program that will be in place for the county legislative offices in 2021. The board is very encouraged and the council should be proud that other jurisdictions continue to look at New York City for inspiration. We should also be proud that our program continues to deliver strong results for and instill confidence in both candidates and voters. Candidates continue to show confidence in the program by volunteering to participate at very high rates. For the September primary elections, 82% of candidates on the ballot joined the matching funds program. The Campaign Finance Board paid out slightly more than $17 million in public funds to 106 candidates. The 2017 mayoral race included four televised debates, two each before the primary and the general elections, and both major party nominees accepted public financing for the second election in a row. These facts point to the, a program that remains very popular with candidates from all parts of the city and across the political spectrum. The program provided real value to voters as well. Matching funds help encourage deeper participation in the political process by New Yorkers. Research clearly shows that individual contributors are willing to invest small contributions in city campaigns, knowing their support will be amplified by matching funds. This broad base of support at the contributor level helps ensure that diverse voices from every corner of the city have an opportunity to be heard. The matching fund program can, provides every candidate with the opportunity to get their message before the voters and ensures that access to wealth is not the only path to electoral success. Because of the matching funds program, the 2017 elections were more competitive, small donors were empowered, and voters were better educated about their choices at the polls. The board looks forward to continuing our productive relationship with the City Council, especially over the coming year. 
CFB staff are working on the comprehensive review of the program and the work of the CFB that we prepare following every citywide election cycle. The report will include the board's legislative recommendations for the council to consider. We appreciate the opportunity to partner with the council to help ensure the program continues to best serve the public and the candidates who choose to participate. Turning back now to our fiscal year 2019 budget. Overall, our budget is $36 million lower than last year. For the matching funds, we are allocating $1 million to cover any potential special elections. For fiscal year 2018, we budgeted $29 million for the campaign finance fund. Please note that as we have done in, pre excuse me, <coughs> in previous elections, the CFB returned unused campaign finance funds to the City General Fund in November 2017. For the Good Voter Guide, we have allocated roughly $3.5 million in 2019 compared to $11 million in 2018. We anticipate printing a citywide voter guide for the general election on November 6 that will cover ballot proposals from the Mayor's, Mayor de Blasio's Charter Revision Commission. <coughs> Excuse me. The CFB has reduced spending on day-to-day -day operations by 1.2% compared to fiscal 2018. Specifically, we have reduced our non-personnel spending by more than $1 million to reflect a reduced staff workload in a non-city election year. We have increased staffing levels modestly, as you can see in our personnel services line. The majority of additional staff will join our audit and systems unit. New audit staff will immediately help complete the post-election audits from the 2017 election and begin laying the groundwork for what promises to be a very busy 2021 election cycle. I would like to briefly outline some of the steps we have taken to streamline the audit process. Audit staff implemented these changes for the 2017 campaigns and we've already seen an impact on speeding up our post-election audit work. In June 2017, we started providing campaigns in the matching funds program with a summary of where they stood from a compliance standpoint. The intention in sending this summary was to help campaigns understand and fix any compliance issues that might prevent them from receiving public funds. This is in fact our intention for most of the work that our candidate services and audit staff perform. Each disclosure statement review is an opportunity for us to help candidates fix errors and resolve issues that might prevent payment. Our goal is to help candidates achieve compliance and receive public funds. Our goal is to enable citizens from all walks of life to run for office. For the 2017 post-election audits that are now underway, audit staff are issuing doc document requests that are tailored to each campaign and include more details on potential compliance issues than in previous years. These tailored requests should allow campaigns to directly respond to specific potential audit issues and resolve them. We piloted this pr approach during the special elections that were held for city council between 2015 and 2017. We found that the resulting draft audit reports were shorter and that campaigns had resolved many issues that otherwise would have been in the draft audit. Indeed, 13 of the 19 campaigns in those special elections that have completed the audit process did not receive any violations or penalties. We are already seeing positive results from these and other changes we've made to the process. The CFB has issued draft audit reports to 68 campaigns, more than one-third of the total draft audits we anticipate sending in the 2017 election cycle. At this point in 2014, we had not issued any draft audits for the 2013 campaigns. Making real progress in streamlining audits is one of our key goals, but has practical implications as well. As I mentioned before, the 2021 elections promise to be the most competitive in a generation. We estimate that 500 candidates will register with the CFB by the fall of 2021, a 45% increase in the number of candidates from 2017. We project that there could be 44 open seats. For comparison, in 2001, the first election under term limits, there were 44 open seats and 526 candidates registered with the CFB. Thus far, 20 candidates have registered with us for the 2021 cycle. They will file their first disclosure statement in July. At this point in 2001, only five candidates had registered. In addition to the sheer volume of candidates and open seats, 2021 will present new challenges as the CFB prepares to implement new requirements in the program, including early payments. Preparing for those new requirements will mean additional work for candidate services and audit, as well as new development to our information architecture. 
Our systems unit has begun an incomprehensive project to update the CFB's campaign finance information system. Some of the additional staff we were adding for fiscal 2019 will assist with this work. KIFIS is the backbone of our data disclosure and compliance systems. Improvements to it, which communicates with CSMART, our candidate disclosure system, and virtually every other application that CFB runs, will be critical to ensuring a smooth 2021 election. We have an online dis candidate disclosure system that is the envy of every other campaign finance system in the country. But the bottom line is the underlying architecture needs to be modernized. At the end of this project, we anticipate having a brand new KIFIS that will significantly streamline the interactions candidates have with the CFB. <coughs> In addition to our work on early payments and other new requirements, system staff is currently working to implement the online voter registration portal following the legislation passed by the council last year. We are very excited to release that portal in June of 2019. Before concluding, I would like to draw your attention to our 2018 voter assistance report, which was delivered to all council member offices at the end of April. The report addresses the many efforts we made in 2017 to increase voter participation through our NYC Votes campaign and outlines election reforms that should be adopted in Albany to increase voter turnout. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer your questions. <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> yes, I'm fine. This is, okay, this is good. There's water right there. So uh, thank you for your testimony, and uh, we now have some questions. I'll be asking some questions, and then uh, Chair Cabrera, and then we're going to go to council member questions as well. So um, let me talk a little bit about lease ex expenditures. In the executive plan, the Campaign Finance Board's lease budget, which is in the Department for Citywide Services budget, was reduced by 200000 in fiscal 2019. Why is your lease, lease budget decreasing, and what efforts are you making to um, make sure, make more efficient use of space? Um, the, uh, that reduction is mainly due to the reduced need for supplemental heating and air conditioning uh, that we anticipate over this next fiscal year compared to last fiscal year. Are you still moving uh, the office space to 255 Granite Street? Um, as the commissioner from DCAS uh, testified, we are working with DCAS to uh, f finish our revised uh, needs assessment and then we'll look for new office space, yes, because the current office space does not fit the number of headcount we have right now. So the office space you were originally looking for seemed to be very large to members of the council. What size space are you now looking for? We haven't finalized the, that, that work that needs assessment with DCAS yet, so I don't have the precise number. Well, what are you looking for? I know you, I know you, 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 you can't tell me what you found, but what type of space are you looking for? Oh, I mean, I'm sorry, maybe I wasn't clear. Sure. Um, the needs assessment is a process with DCAS where you put in the number of the headcount, they say this kind of person gets this amount of space, and then they calculates the full, the, the square footage that we needed, and that number has not been finished I yet. I see. So at the last time around, you were looking for community space as well if I'm not mistaken. Well, we... To have uh, space to bring in people for conferences and conference rooms? Yeah, I mean, our space, I mean, part of the DCAS uh, assessment plan allows for a certain number of conference space per, uh, per staff member because it's in an open plan uh, setting, and so there needs to be some place for people to have conferences to not disrupt the rest of the staff. So that, that, that those conference spaces would be used for staff meetings? Yes. How large are those conference spaces? Again, the, 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 the assessment, we're using their new, they had revised their needs assessment, the way they do the needs assessment. And so uh, I, I, we haven't finalized that, so I don't know how many, it will be based on their number. So it's, it, the way I understand it works is based on the number of staff you have, then you get a conference room per Eight, I mean, I don't know the exact number, but you know, per staff member, and then that's how they assign the space. Um, so, do you have a, a, a space for community needs or something like that? I thought I heard in the last testimony by DCAS that there was a need for community uh, meetings. Um, we have, I guess, there's two. We have, we have two 
needs. I mean, we do, we have a special need for a training room because the, the law requires us to provide training. Uh, every candidate ha and their staff have to be trained. So one of the ne community needs, I guess, is what they're referring to is that training room. And the other is our public board room where we hold our public board meetings. Okay. I'm okay, sorry. good. I think that's what we need yeah. a little clarification on. Okay. So um, voter guide for charter, uh, for the charter commission. The executive plan, um, plan includes 3.4 million for voter guides in fiscal 2019. Is this uh, for a referendum on the findings of the mayor charter commission? Uh, commission? The law requires that when there is a referendum on the ballot uh, that the CFB produce a citywide voter guide um, on that to inform voters about that referendum. So anticipating that the mayor's charter revision commission would uh, make recommendations for a referendum in this fall's budget, uh, in this fall's uh, election, we put money in the budget to pay for that but mandatory that's a separate voter, voter guide? What? That's a separate voter it, guide? Yeah, yes. It's, a, it's a, a voter guide that would go citywide. We would have no voter guide that was mailed to, to everyone right. in the city this year because there's no city election. Okay. And can I ask how often do you provide voter guides? Um, we provide the voter guide every, we print and mail a voter guide every year that there is a citywide election. Um, also, we print and mail voter guides when there are uh, charter referendum uh, ballot initiatives. And, but we do produce online voter guides for pretty much every election that occurs. So there's going to be a June primary. There will be an online voter guide for that. And, what, and for special elections, do you do that? We do the online guide for special uh, elections. Uh, just the online? Um, I, mean, for, I, I think there, in certain circumstances, we have to print and mail for those off-year elections, but I would have to I'd get back to you to make sure that that you know, okay, got. good. That's a, an issue that I, 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 I wanted to actually know a little bit more yeah. about sure. how that works. Um, We're happy to provide more information about that. How do you uh, make sure that eligible voters know that a race is imminent? Are they made aware of special elections to take place in their voting district? Do you pre-send out a notice before you send out a voting guide, or how does that process work? Um, well, we do a lot of different kinds of voter education and engagement work surrounding uh, special elections. Uh, we do, we have a list, an email list that we have collected over time and people that are in that district will send email alerts that the election is happening. We do phone banking to tell people that the election is happening. We do uh, social media advertising to make sure that people, targeted at people in that area to make sure that they know that there's an election coming. Okay. Um, in terms of referendums, the mayor is planning a referendum on the findings of his charter commission. Um, how else can referendums be called? Um, I'm not an expert in it, but I, my understanding, I mean, so I, I'll give you my understanding of, is that the city council can also, uh, and also there's a provision for a citizen uh, How does initiative. that work? Do you know? I mean, I think it's, again, a, like a petition jive, but I would have to do some more research on that. I don't Does know. that come under your purview, though? Do we? Uh, no, I, I mean, we, we would send, if there was a city of sin initiative uh, referendum, that would, we would produce a voter guide for that, but we wouldn't be involved in but the process other a, than um, that. But if there was a voter interest in writing a referendum, um, would you have involvement in that? In writing the referendum and I mean in terms of I think what well, you have to collect a certain number of petitions yeah in order for it to be on the ballot and the mayor can bump it um, and then I was wondering if, 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 if it happens from a citizen initiated uh, referendum what would your role be in that the, the only official role we would have in that is in producing the voter guide if there was a referendum on the ballot um, okay one of my favorite topics, auditing of candidates. <laughs> uh, I must say that you have made great progress. Uh, my audit already came in and uh, looking good. <laughs> and, um, but I know that it was a problem in the past. And, it, and from your testimony, you said that you are making progress, and I would agree with that. So can you briefly go over the process of how you audit candidates? Is there a certain um, threshold of you know candidates, or how do you decide? Is it 
now that the system has changed somewhat, you're doing these, um, uh, I guess, monthly or not even monthly, they're, they're core, I forget, by, uh, you divide up the system into different periods to, uh, where candidates have an opportunity to submit pre-audits and then you get back to candidates. When you see that candidates are not likely to have a high number of violations, do you do those candidates first or how do you decide what to do first? Um, well, we audit, you know, as, as you explained, we audit during the, throughout the election cycle. So after each disclosure statement that's filed and in the years preceding an election, those are every six months in January and July, and we will send what we, what we call statement reviews, but are essentially pre-audits, uh, identifying areas of concern and dis both compliance and disclosure uh, to the candidates and giving them an opportunity to remedy those. And then after the election, we audit all the candidates um, and we uh, send, well, as I said, for we've enhanced our initial document request to be more specified. Uh, we've, so we don't. But what, what I'm trying to get at also is that not every candidate gets an audit like I think in your, in your testimony you mentioned that you've already audited a certain number of candidates as of this point. So how do you decide to do those candidates first, those who have gotten it now, and then the other ones later on? Well, the first thing we did was we sent the initial document requests, um, so that we did first. But that's done to everybody? Um, I mean, has every candidate who ran in 2017 gotten the initial document request? Well, we did, we, um, did some rational assessments of how to provide those information. So not everyone got a initial document request. So what I'm, what I'm trying to get at is how long would it be till they get those initial document requests for other candidates who have not yet received them? So the, the process for people, there's, so some people will get an initial, initial document request, they'll respond to it, then they'll get a draft audit and they can respond to it. Mm -hmm. um, so those initial document requests went out, those responses are coming in. Um, while those responses are coming in, we did the draft audits for the people who didn't have the initial document requests. So those, uh, you know, as I said, 68 so of those have gone out. you choose them as, as at random? No, they're based on, uh, on, on certain, you know, factors based on, you know, the receipt of public funds, the uh, being I a participant, non-participant, you know. So the, the, maybe yes. you hit the people yeah. who, um, did not accept public funds first, and then you go to others afterwards, and then that sometimes there are legal problems that you can't do them right away. Uh, is that how? I mean, there are some, yes. And, uh, and again, we did all the initial document requests, which are, because it's the longest process, we started that first, and then we did, while we were waiting for those to uh, Come in. come in, we did the next group, the people who are going to just get a draft audit so that there be kind of, you know, work going on. And so as those initial document requests come in, then we'll start sending out their draft audits. The people who have already gotten their draft audits will be responding and so we can kind of, you know, leverage the leapfrogging of timing of people's responses. So do you have an estimate about when you think you might get through the majority or three quarters, 75 percent of the, of the 17 candidates, of the 2017 candidates? Um, again, I, I, it's hard to make a, an estimate, but we are well in advance of where we were in 2013, so I'm optimistic that this process will end well in advance of 2013. Um, it has always been one of our major goals is to speed up the process of the audits, and I think that this new process will do that. Um, also, making the document requests more detailed will help in this next phase, because candidates will have a more uh, tailored request, so they'll be able to give a more tailored response, which will help you know, all the, down the line. Because I noticed that this week, I believe, you're having a hearing uh, on a 2013 candidate. So that candidate um, is just now being given the opportunity to, I don't know if it was an appeal or a hearing on it, but to, so that you, you still have some outstanding 13. He is, yeah, he's one of the last uh, people. And, and, and again, his was because of significant complicate, complicated issues that were involved in that audit. Okay, but you're pretty much done with all the others. Yes, there's like um, a handful. 
I, I don't want to say the exact number, but I think two or th maybe or three. Okay, because you know the concern is is that um, is it that you cannot open can, you cannot begin to raise funds unless an audit has been done. No, that's not the case. That's not the case. No. Okay. So like if so if you ran in thirteen and the audit wasn't completed, you could still raise funds for seventeen, right? Yes. Okay. Um, how many auditors are assigned to each candidate? Or how many candidates does one auditor cover? Um, it varies depending on basically the time of the election cycle and what work uh, needs to be done. So it's, uh, I can't give you a precise number, but the auditors work in teams. So there is a senior auditor and two auditors that work in a team um, on a, a, a body of audits. Uh, and so they can assist each other and help um, out. Again, some audits are more complicated. You know, a citywide aud a audit for a citywide candidate will be more complicated than an audit for, you know, a, a city council candidate who, that didn't have much activity. So again, there has to be some balance so it's not a, you know, necessary per capita assessment. And what are they basically looking for? What are those auditors looking for? I'm sorry? What are they looking for? Um, well, the, what they're, the main, they look for compliance with the Campaign Finance Act, uh, that the money that, in the case of people who receive public funds, that the money was raised um, and appropriately and that it was spent appropriately. And that the disclosure is complete. And again, that's an important public good that we do is to provide the disclosure, so to making sure that, it's, uh, that the disclosure is complete and accurate. I guess it's a little early to know too much about uh, the 2017 election. But in terms of, let's say, 2013, approximately how many violations were issued to candidates participating in the matching funds program? And approximately what share of candidates had a violation? Um, I don't have that number, but again, we, I mean, I have that number. I don't have it on me, so I'm happy to get that for you. Okay. Okay, I think that's it for me. And I want to turn it over to Chair Cabrera. Thank you so much, Director. Welcome. Uh, let me start with uh, matching funds for fiscal 2019. Uh, we uh, took a notice that for the fiscal 2019 budget, it includes only $1 million for the matching fund program. Uh, do you believe this is enough? L let's suppose. Uh, uh, we have a citywide race uh, in the city, and we were to add uh, a couple of extra uh, council members who might decide to move on to, to other uh, aspirations. Uh, would a million dollars be enough if we were in that situation? Well, it, you know, uh, we, issued, we submitted our budget um, in March, so, um, the political landscape changes all the time, so I'd, I'd have to go back and analyze, you know, whether a uh, million dollars would be sufficient. We might, um, the law does allow for emergency appropriation of public funds if the fund that was allocated was not enough, but let me look at that precise question and get back to you. Uh, and, and you said that the law uh, provides for emergency. Where would that uh, source of funding come from? It comes from the general fund. From the general yeah. fund. Uh, do, you, do you have an estimate if we were to have a citywide based on past history, uh, what it will cost to do a citywide? Um, well, citywide candidates can get, a, I'm trying to say the number right, uh, around a million and a half for public advocate, $3 million for mayor. So. Um, so yeah, I mean that's the that's the maximum that any one candidate could get. So yeah, that's a substantial amount of yes, money. Yes. Uh, of money uh, plus multiply that by God knows how many people uh, could be potentially running. I, I just want us to uh, be attentive to that as you as you stated. Uh, political landscapes uh, could change literally overnight, <laughs> as as we're seeing um, recently. Thank you for pointing that out. So I uh, also wanted to ask you, uh, in terms of the Charter Commission, have you been approached uh, 
for your input on any potential reforms? So, as I said in my testimony, we are, after every election, the board is charged with the uh, obligation to review how the program worked in the previous election and make recommendations. And so our staff is in the process of preparing our report. Um, but we, of course, are prepared to provide uh, suggestions and recommendations to the Charter Vision Commission. In general, uh, you know, we've always worked very well with, with the council in making uh, enhancements and improvements to the program. Uh, you know, if, if we were asked by the Charter Vision Commission, which we have, they have not had subject matter uh, requests yet, uh, we would say that uh, to the extent that the commission is thinking about other models than the small dollar matching funds program, we think that our program works very well. We think that it has, that a break from our current system would not necessarily be a wise choice for the city. Um, we have, we do know that there's sentiment from, you know, across advocates and candidates and, and the public that there should be lower barriers for running for office and that the public fund should more help candidates. And so we are very much uh, aware of that and are always thinking about on our recommendations about ways that we can enhance the way that the public matching funds helps candidates run for office. Are you, are you were your recommendations, or are you leaning towards uh, uh, the max uh, that uh, someone could give to be lower, or to be higher, to re uh, remain the same? Um, I think we, you know, we haven't finalized our recommendations yet, but I think what we would, I mean, in, in definitely when we make our recommendations, they will be in the sco scope of adjusting the current parameter, so adjusting the current contribution limits or the spending limits or the amount of ma public matching funds that are available um, within the same parameters of the same kind of public matching funds program. Uh, I'm curious, I, you, I just want to make sure that I heard right. No, nobody from the Charter Commission has approached you, uh, but has uh, anybody from the administration approached you? Oh, I mean, we'll talk to people. I'm, I'm sorry, I mean, okay. I miss, I mean, not that we haven't spoken to people in the Charter Region. I just meant that they have not issued their official request for public testimony from us as subject matter experts. Uh, are you at liberty to talk about any questions that they've been asking regarding uh, from the Charter Commission uh, or any kind of questions in particular there? I mean, I, again, I think a lot of it is about how can we enhance the amount of money that candidates receive so that and and the way they receive the money to make sure that the program is helping as many people as they can and particularly people running for citywide offices you know make sure that that's helping them as much as it possibly can yeah I, I find it interesting and I really is it's a compliment that you have other cities that uh, other counties, Montgomery County, Maryland, Washington, D.C. Uh, for 2020, uh, we saw Suffolk County in 2021 uh, for what we have right now. So I'm, I'd be, I'm gonna be looking to see if, if it's working so good right now, why we will need changes. Uh, and if we need a changes, why not just do one right now? Um, I mean, I think there are some empirical, and that's part of our research, and that's why we're not ready with our recommendations, right. some empirical, you know, analysis to be done about whether we are enhancing the, uh, the small dollar match um, across the whole spectrum of types of candidates, from citywide to city council candidates. And so that's, you know, part of what we're analyzing. I agree, yes, our program works very, very well. We certainly get small dollar contributors throughout the city. Uh, you know, if you look at the maps of contributors compared, you know, to other elections, you know, you see that there's contrib contributions being given of, at, in every census block in New York City. Um, but again, there are always ways that it could be improved, and in particular, looking at how the program works in the varied kinds of offices. Look, in, in principle, I, I just want to state publicly that for someone who had never been involved in politics before I went in government, uh, when I first ran uh, nine years ago, 
Um, it, it definitely had an impact on me being here. Uh, and so I, I definitely believe in principle. I'm just looking f forward to see your report coming out in September, I believe is coming out. Th that's when it's due, but I think that we'll probably, because of the enhanced, the charter region, we'll probably make our rec some, really some re recommendations earlier than that. And how, how early do you expect? I mean, I, I would say soon. I mean, because the Charter Revision Commission is meeting over the summer, so probably, you know. So, you know sometime yeah, in June, that, perhaps, probably. or yes. okay, early June. That, okay, looking forward uh, to uh, reading your report. Last question, because I know our colleagues have a question as well. Uh, in terms of the matching program, how uh, does, uh, how do we compare uh, the 2017 um, citywide elections and uh, compared to 2014 um, in, in terms of, let me be more specific. Uh, I had, it's a twofold question. One is in terms of the expenditure uh, that we spend and also your forecasting as I recall, uh, that we will have, you're estimating 500 candidates will register for CFB for the same amount of open seats, uh, and yet the, in 20, 2001, we have 526 uh, candidates registered with CFB. Uh, I'm curious as to, in the second question, uh, why you're expecting less people for the same amount of seats open uh, to run? I mean, I, I, I guess, you know, 500 and 526 is, you know, not a sizable difference when you talk <laughs> in scale. Um, it, it, you know, it's based on that estimate of 500, again, is very much an estimate. Um, and it's based on kind of the experience over the course of time that, you know, 2001 was the very first year that there was term limits. Um, we've had a lot of elections since then, so the 500 is based on you know continual estimations throughout that period of time. Hmm. I, my, my guess is uh, that there will be more that we had last time. I think there's an enthusiasm for people to run for office. I could tell you that in my own district, uh, the level of eagerness is, is way higher than when I first ran, and we had a substantial amount of people uh, running. Well, thank you so much. I'll turn it back to the chair. Uh, I appreciate uh, your comments today. Thank you. And we have questions from Council Member Yeager, followed by Kalos, and then Majority Leader Combo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I wanted to go after uh, Council Member Kalos because uh, it's usually better to follow the genius on these topics. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Director. Um, I had a question about uh, the, to follow up on one of the chairs who asked you a question about uh, contribution limits and um, uh, whether in, they're in the right place or not, and you don't really yet have an official position, I guess, because the Charter Revision Commission hasn't asked you for one, but I anticipate whether they ask you for one or not, you're going to offer your expertise to either the, uh, the Mayor's Commission or the one that I voted against here in the Council. Um, so my question to you is, uh, in 2001, uh, the contribution limits uh, for citywide office were 4,500 for mayor and the other two citywide offices. In 2005, they went up, and the other two categories, borough president and council, each went up by across the board 10%, uh, 40, 4,500 to 4,950, 2,500 to 2,750, 35 to 3,850. Uh, this year, for the first time, they're going up. They haven't moved from 2005 until 2021 cycle. They're now going up $150 per person. So that's obviously less than 10%. I'm just curious if you can tell us a little bit about, I know that they're tied to the cost of living increase or the uh, consumer price index or whatnot, and I'm curious not for you to tell me about whether or not you think that uh, you complied with what the statute says, but whether or not you think they're high enough, low, too low, too high, just right, you're um, the expert. I think that, uh, uh, to answer the first part of the question, you're exactly correct that they are, the difference, the amounts that they go up is by the consumer price index, so that's why it's a different percentage uh, that the change from 2005 to 2000, 
I'm not remembering the right years, but you know, every four years it changes, um, and it's because of the computer. But it hasn't, but it hasn't actually moved from five. Five, it stopped, and it stayed at it stayed at the 2005 number for 2009 cycle, 2013 cycle, 2017 cycle. It was frozen for all those cycles. Now, for the first time since the 2005 cycle, it's going up, but it's going up by $150. Uh, per contribution. My question is whether or not that's a sufficient move, not whether or not it's in compliance with the law. Um, yes, I understood that. I just was saying that, I was just explaining that you're right, that that's why they changed. Um, the, I think that, you know, part of the goal of the program is to encourage contributions from small dollar donors. That's why we have the multiple matching funds. Um, and that is a general goal that we, you know, the value is that more citizens that become involved in the election is a good thing. Um, most citizens aren't giving contributions at the high, at the maximum level because they are unable to. And so the, the always encouraging smaller contributors, encouraging more participation is always a goal. So that's, you know, when we start looking at whether our contribution limits are high or, to, you know, the right place, it's be to look at it from that framework that, that they are encouraging the maximum amount of participation uh, by individuals in New York City. And so <coughs> I, I think that, you know, a lot of discussion is about, again, the impact of large contributions, because even with the match, you know, you get $175, as, which is the maximum, but even $175 is a fairly large amount for a lot of people. So say you give $10 and the candidate receives $70 worth of value from that. Um, and then, the, uh, if, say for a city council candidate, you know, you go out and get $2750. The, 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 the difference in value between getting one large contribution or one small contribution plus the matching funds, we always want to try and lower that gap so that you can improve the value of the public matching funds. As the, uh, as over the last, uh, Mr. Chairman, I know my bell rang, but thank you. Uh, as the, uh, over the last several cycles and uh, every single cycle, the, the cap for each race goes up and we've kept the contribution limit at the same limit, which essentially means, and, and again, we've done that now, we've raised the cap, and we've raised the limit a little bit, but not, it, it, they're not hitting the same place. Now, the public fund's maximum is 55% of the cap, and that's what somebody can get. But at the same time, since we're raising the cap each time, we're not moving the maximum contribution limit. We're essentially making candidates do more fundraising. Now, you call it raising more contributions uh, from that are smaller, and that would be great. If everybody in my district gave $10, I would have uh, 1.8 million dollars, right? That would be, fan I think that's the math. That would be fantastic, that's not the way it works. So you have to go out there and fundraise. And what we're essentially doing, especially because we've also limited who can contribute over the last decade and a half, we've taken away LLCs, we've taken away corporations, we've taken away those who do business with the city. So now we've basically asked our candidates, us and those, anybody who wants to run against any of us, uh, to go out there and fundraise. And they spend a significant amount of time fundraising and I haven't gotten to the part where they also spend a significant amount of time and money on paying people in order to be able to comply with the laws and the regulations of your agency. But we're not, we're not moving the, the numbers well enough, in my estimation, to take away the obligation of candidates to go out and fundraise for as, often, as long as they have to during the course of a campaign. We don't want candidates, as, of, as great as $10 contributions are, we don't want candidates to have to spend their entire the entirety of their campaigns going out, knocking door to door and asking people for money, right? Um, well, I mean, a lot of this small dollar fundraising is part of small dollar campaigning. I mean, you have a, an, you know, an event where you have, you know, the citizenry, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's campaigning and fundraising. So, I mean, I don't, I don't think that they're mutually exclusive. I mean, if you're, again, you know, calling for big dollar contributions maybe is not the same feel as campaigning. Um, and again, I, I'm not doing the fundraising, but I mean, again, it's part of you can have an event and have, you know, people come and hear a campaign speech and give a small dollar contribution and that contribution is valued. It is important. So, I mean, it, so the idea is you have to look at all the components. You have to look at the spending limit. You have to look at the contribution limit, 
the matching funds, the matching rate, uh, the maximum, you know, that you can get, you know, like that 175, you know, the maximum, uh, the cap on what public matching funds are. So, you know, it's 55% now, you know, so all of those things have to be looked at to, again, <coughs> excuse me, um, to get the most, you know, the value that we want, which is trying to encourage more people to be involved in the political process. Uh, Chair Drum uh, asked earlier about the uh, questions about the audits and the initial documentation requests and the draft audit reports, and you've indicated in your testimony that you've now done 68 draft audit reports, uh, which is the highest number at this point in the site. It's, it's incredible work. I know that uh, the staff has worked hard on that. Um, and uh, I also know that you have now tailored your initial documentation requests in a better way so that you're you know, not trying to kill a mosquito with an Uzi, and uh, that's, that's definitely recognizable, uh, recognized. I, my question is, do you believe at this point that the draft order reports and the process by which they're issued are, is the best it can be, or is there more work? And as a follow-up to that, do you actually read the draft order reports before they're issued? Do I personally read every draft yes. audit report? That would probably slow down the process by a huge amount, so no, I don't. Oh, do you read any? I read some of them. I mean, I read the, I read the, the boilerplate, the, you know, what, mm -hmm. the, how it's presented. They're using the same boilerplate for every single campaign across the board, even where the boilerplate doesn't match the facts of the campaign. So, for example, they're stating that they visited a campaign site when they didn't visit a campaign site. They're saying that they uh, read complaints that were filed against the candidate and and the candidate was afforded the ability to respond even when most campaign candidates don't have complaints filed against them. They're using the same boilerplate to cross the board. So I, I would urge you that, not, that the process by which these things are approved to go out don't stop at the director of auditing, but they go a little higher to somebody of your stature who I know has been doing this for so long that you actually you get the feel for the campaigns, you get the feel for the documents, and you know what candidates are seeing and campaigns uh, should be seeing. I'll look into that. Thank you. Okay. Um, but uh, just to, to, are we good? Okay, all right, so I don't want to take away Ben's time. I know he's, I'm good. you're good? Okay, all right. Um, uh, the, we'll get you everywhere. Yes, well, ben and, I, ben and I have a great relationship. He feeds me the questions into my head. Um, <laughs> the the uh, draft audit report process, in my estimation, uh, and, and we have discussed this offline in the past uh, with me and you and your staff, um, uh, sometimes, uh, uh, to use my analogy, is uh, whacking a mosquito with an Uzi. Um, and I believe that, that uh, they're, and I think they should look at them, but I think that they're asking for things, uh, particularly with respect to campaigns that didn't take public funds. And I want to separate out the campaigns that have public funds obligations, that took public funds, they have an obligation to demonstrate the use of the public funds. Unquestionably, they have an obligation to make demonstration with respect to all of their uh, activity. But with respect to candidate campaigns that were relatively simple, and their activity is relatively simple, and their activity was disclosed, and the documentation throughout the course of the campaign was, was viewed by the CFB and no real red flags. And my sense is that, uh, that the auditors simply have this kind of rule book and say, well, this is what we're supposed to do, and we're going to do that for each campaign across the board, which I think is a little bit of what Chairman Drum was alluding to, whether or not you're making different judgment calls about different campaigns and uh, whether or not the, you, you are actually trying to kill the mosquito with the Uzi. Um, in, the, in the cases of relatively small campaigns or relatively innocuous campaigns, the level of documentation and the level of inquiry that's still being asked, even notwithstanding the fact that there were no public funds used, uh, is still tremendous. And do you think that that's necessarily a good use of the limited resources that you have in your agency? Well, I mean, again, at, you know, we do, as you said, I mean, we've, we've looked at the process every single time we do it, and we try and, uh, again, make sure that we're asking for rational requests. Um, I'm happy to talk to you offline more about, you know, the specifics about this. Um, I think that we are, you know, we, what we're trying to do, in, you know, in making the draft audits is we're trying to help people you know, point out areas where there might be deficiency in compliance or disclosure. Um, and so it's, it's supposed to give people, you know, an opportunity to answer some questions in advance of potential violations. And so what we're trying to do is trying to help people comply by pointing out 
you know, the issues where they haven't complied. Um, again, can I say that, you know, I, I don't know what specific examples you're talking about. I mean, we have very much tried to, to tailor the request to the level of request to the level of se potential severity of the finding. Um, again, you know, we do comply with GAGAS, so there is a certain level of requirement that you, you know, are consistent in, and, uh, in your auditing processes. Okay. Um, what is your extension policy with regard to candidates who receive either IDRs that they can't immediately answer or, uh, or DARs that they can't immediately answer? And I know immediate, at, at, the in, at the outset, a 30-day extension is relatively simple to obtain, and then one additional extension of if the candidate asks for a month, they kind of knock them down to two weeks. Is there, is there a, a guidance of how that is determined, or is it a case-by-case -case basis, or is it just, you know, sometimes yes, sometimes no, or? I, I mean, I think that you, your, your framework, what you just outlined, is basically the, the basic, uh, off the, you know, right off the bat, uh, extension policy. Um, obviously, candidates have all sorts of extenuating circumstances and are those uh, requests are evaluated based on their extenuated stances, depending on you know health issues, business issues, you know all different um, issues. We are actually in the process of you know making sure that we have uniform extension standards. But what you've just described is is the basic policy that it's very you know the first request we give you a 30-day extension, um, and then uh, asking again because. We're under deadlines. We want to also make sure that we, you know, keep the process. One, one going of the forward. one of the things I've noticed with regard to the extensions policy is that, as you know, when a candidate submits their request, their response to whether it's the uh, IDR, whether it's the DAR, um, at, assuming the candidate does it on time within the 30 days, it goes to the CFB. It doesn't get opened that day by the auditor. Time to read what this guy submitted. Let's get it done. It sits. And it could sit for a week, it could sit for three weeks, it could sit for six months until it gets looked at. And we know that because the response to that from the CFB comes several months later. So my question is, what would the great harm be to giving a candidate, giving campaigns the additional time that they say they need um, within reason? I'm not saying that a campaign should ask for a year, but if a campaign says we need an extra 30 days instead of knocking them down to, an, you know, well, you can only have two weeks. Because when the campaign submits it in two weeks, it's not going to get read. It's not going to get read the week later. It's not going to get read two weeks later. It's just going to sit there until it's queued up and the auditor is ready to read it. Um, you know, again, I mean, as we, you know, we try and, and as I was trying to explain to Chair Trump, is, you know, we're trying to do this in waves. So, you know, as we send out the IDRs, then we send out the drafts, and then we, so, you know, we're getting the response to the IDRs, then we're sending out more drafts. So, I mean, there is a method to, you know, the the flow. But again, um, we are, tr we do tr tend to be fairly generous in our granting of extension requests. Uh, so, uh, but again, you know, everyone's, it's in everyone's interest to have the audits done in a timely fashion. And so uh, we do often ask for the reason for the, that the extension is needed. And again, uh, you know, we've heard, I mean, there are definitely very good reasons for people to need six months and even at times a year extension. You know, that's happened. All right, uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. May I just, uh, two suggestions that I have also while I think about it in regard to the voter guides. One is that um, in the um, paper guides that were sent out prior to the primaries, uh, those who did not have primaries were not listed in there. Is there any way that you can say there's no primary in a certain district because it did cause confusion in districts where there were no primaries? Um, I, I mean, I, I'll look into that, but I, it's my understanding, I think, that w there is at least a blanket, and maybe it could be more clear, uh, a statement that if they're not, if your district's not listed, that there's no primary in that district. But uh, again, making it more clear is something okay. that and is And my second suggestion. suggestion in terms of the video voter guide um, is that um, when the video voter guide came out initially uh, this time around, um, for those who did not have primaries, again, a um, statement was made um, on the uh, website, uh, no information provided for those people who did not have a primary. I don't know if you were aware of that. Um, and that was corrected, okay. but certainly yeah. we wouldn't want to see that happen again, that the fault was placed on the candidate. No, no, that's absolutely correct. There should be, it should be clear that there's no primary, not but that are you were aware of that, right? Yes. Okay, all right, thank you.
All right, so next, um, Councilmember Kalos and then Combo. Good afternoon. Uh, like to uh, start by just uh, following up. So in our previous hearing with the New York City Board of Elections, uh, the current executive director acknowledged that on occasion he signs for credit cards electronically, uh, not with a pen and paper, but electronically, and that that is valid for payment purposes. Uh, and for those who are watching at home and might have been wondering why or just in general, it was because uh, we are working on an online voter registration process. Uh, we passed legislation last term. It was signed into law by the mayor. Uh, and uh, I've already built a site <laughs> at bencalos.com uh, where folks can actually register online and, and print it out. And it, it doesn't actually accomplish the la pe last piece of transmitting the items digitally, but literally we could just print it out from my website and do so. And I think I did it in about, uh, I'm going to guess less than an hour. Uh, and so I guess the question is, where is the CFB in implementing this? I know at the time the law allows a whole two years, but given the fact that it only took me uh, an hour, how, where, where are we a couple of months later? Um, so we're, you know, we're building our online site and, you know, again, we, we're still hopeful that we'll have the cooperation of the Board of Elections in uh, providing these documents. Um, uh, we are using our in-house staff rather than an outside vendor because we wanted to be able to maintain and improve the system over the course of time as uh, needs change. Uh, the planning is well underway and we hope to have a prototype uh, sometime this summer uh, for to have a fully functional site uh, before the board's, the deadline which is in the beginning of next year. So I guess the, 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 the sooner the better. And uh, are you going to be using uh, free and open source libraries? And will what you create be free and open source? Um, you know, we've always had an op. Uh, I'm not a technical person, as we do, we've, you and I have discussed <laughs> before. Um, but, but one of the CFB I, I do, members is. I do know what is. you mean by open source <laughs> libraries. Um, uh, I am not certain, but we've always provided our code to people who need it, uh, whether in the open source library venue or as you know, people ask for it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go further with that, but I guess the, the key thing is with the Campaign Finance Board, uh, perhaps me, uh, full disclosure, I'm a free and open source software developer. I was also a, in the Drupal community, which is a, uh, a type of software that runs websites like uh, the White House and uh, other small sites like that. Uh, and so they offered to come to the table and work with the CFB to help build out the system and they could probably do it in minutes, not hours. Uh, so I guess, would you be open to meeting with the Drupal meetup community and the folks uh, who built the web forms to pro uh, module? I mean, sure, you know, we, we right. go, we, you know, we always like to talk to people who are interested in helping us. <laughs> Along those same lines, uh, in your testimony, you quote said, we have an online candidate disclosure system that is the envy of every other campaign finance system in the country. And you also note uh, in your testimony that Montgomery County, Maryland is now past this, as well as Washington, D.C., which means we have two other jurisdictions modeled on our system that are in need of a new system at the same time as you are. Is there an opportunity to uh, collaboratively build on free and open source? Uh, you can hire the same vendors, work together, and, and split the cost instead of, let's say, if it costs $3 million, if each municipality pays $1 million, everyone saves, and then each municipality might need to pay an additional small amount to customize the software for themselves. Uh, is there any opportunity to uh, do this collaboratively and allow every other jurisdiction, including Los Angeles, that does this to, to share in this system? Well, I mean, I have to look into that. I'm not, I'm not sure. What, what I was talking about in my testimony is that we're rebuilding our back end. So not, we're not, our, you know, we have our disclosure software. What we're building is the infrastructure database that is 
over almost 30 years old uh, in, that we're running, using the disclosure for all the rest of our operations. Would, would you, so would you, would you be open to making both of those as you're moving forward uh, free and open source for other jurisdictions to, to use, including the state board? We've actually, I mean, we've actually ch shared the, so the CSMART software with other jurisdictions as they've asked for it, um, and also including those state board of elections. We've, we've, we've met with them, and they came to look at our software, the board, state board of elections. They did. Uh, I, I want to thank the uh, finance chair for his indulgence and uh, my many questions. I'd like to just wrap on one key point. In 2013, amongst all mayoral candidates, uh, the most frequent contribution was, I believe, $4,950. Contributions of $4,950, which are the maximum allowed under law, accounted to 49% of the money raised for mayor. In 2017, uh, that trend continued where those contributions accounted for 47%. Uh, given the fact that the public match is 55% of the spending limit, it seems that the amount of big money that we're seeing in the system is directly correlated to the public match. Uh, do your numbers show that? And do you think that if there was a full public match where we matched every small dollar instead of just 55% of them, uh, we would actually have a system where people running for citywide office were having the most frequent contribution of 175 or less instead of $4,950, more than twice as much as you can give to the President of the United States, not that you would give this President anything. Well, as I said to Council Member Yeager, um, I mean, again, this is, you know, the analysis, it's all these things that have to be thought about. The match, matching rate, the you know, the, the top, you know, the amount, the maximum that can be matched, the maximum amount of public funds you can receive, the contribution limit, the spending limit, all of those things have to work in concert to make sure that we're ensuring the best program that we can have. So I think that, you know, it's a, comp it's a confluence of all those things, not just the contribution limit, not just the total amount of public funds, but all of these things to working together. Thank you. I'm going to move on to uh, Majority Leader Combo. Thank you, Chairs. Hi. So, wanted to ask you in 2014, do you know how many candidates received public funds? 2014? There was no. Uh, I mean, 2013, I'm sorry. 13. <laughs> yes. Um, I'd have to get that number. I don't know it off the top of my head. Do you have an estimate? I, I think it was it was 106 in this past election, and I th I want to say that it was 140 ish in 2013. But again, I will have to get you the right number. I'm do you know sorry. out of those? Do you know out of those how many were actually fined? Again, that, that I think that was part of the, co the question that Councilmember Drum, uh, Chair Drum asked about how many people were fined, and we're going to we'll provide that information to the to the committee. So you'll provide us with a number of how many candidates ran and received public funding, and out of those that ran, how many were actually fined? That's correct, yes. Because that's a very important number, yes. because my follow-up questions were, um, have you looked at, because I believe that the campaign uh, uh, matching fund system, and correct me if I'm wrong, was designed to help people that traditionally would not be able to afford to run minorities, people from low-income communities, women that traditionally don't run, people with disabilities, people that you typically don't see as candidates. Would you say that that's fair to say? Yes, and I think that that's the experience that we've had. Okay, now to that end, I think it's also important to know, and I'm going to ask the question, but I understand you don't know the answer. Do you know if minorities, women, people with disabilities are being disproportionately fined as a result of how your system operates? Um, I don't believe so, but again, I would get to the actual numbers. Now, you may not believe so, but if you don't really know how many ran, if you don't know how many got fined, there could be a trend where women, minorities, people of color are disproportionately being fined. 
Um, I mean, I, I, the thing is, I, again, our, our whole process, we try and help all the candidates run for office. We provide the public matching funds. With the public matching funds becomes the auditing process, mm -hmm. and people are penalized from for violations of the act, that's true. And so again, I will get you the numbers of those, but I can't opine because on that. Because we want to make sure that the very people that we are promoted, that, that are actually running, that the program is designed for, doesn't actually hurt, doesn't actually hurt them. And part of the, I mean, as in, as in my testimony, part of the, all the work in the uh, uh, pre-election uh, uh, statement reviews that we provide to candidates, the way that we're doing the new document requests um, and doing the draft audits, all are geared to trying to make sure that people are in compliance and complying and giving them more opportunities. And the results of this, our uh, pilot program for this new IDR are very encouraging. I mean, we have done 19 audits for those special election candidates and 13 of those campaigns had no violations or penalties at all. So again, we are trying to adjust the way we do the audits uh, to make sure that we're assisting the candidates as much as possible. So in 2013, um, so for candidates that did not win, right, how do they pay back their fines? Um, some of them raise money. How do they some raise money? They are allowed to raise money uh, following the same contribution limits uh, that were in effect during the election. So for candidates that did not win, they host fundraisers for losing elections. It's hard to imagine hosting a fundraiser to pay back fines for a losing campaign. Um, people do that. People are running again. People um, pay from private sources. Private sources as in their personal pockets? Some of them. I mean, I... I those yes. would be interesting things that you should find out. Do people have to then utilize their paychecks for other employment? Are they traditionally using their paychecks from whatever jobs they might have? Maybe they're a teacher, maybe they're a bus driver, maybe they have to set aside a certain amount of their payroll every two weeks in order to pay back their fine. Do you think that that's perhaps happening? I, I, I'd have to look into that. Do you know how traditionally long it would take or it takes some of these candidates to pay back their fines that did not win? Uh, again, I don't have that statistic. Do you have to um, pay back all of the money that you were fined before you open up another campaign to run for office? No, you don't, but you will, you're not, the law provides that you're not able to receive additional public funds if you have not repaid uh, fines. So you, do, you can open a new campaign, but you uh, can't receive additional public funds. So you cannot, you cannot technically receive, or in any way, you can't receive public funds until you pay back the fines from a losing campaign. That would be difficult to raise the money to do so. That's, yeah, that's in this, the act, that provision. Mm -hmm. My other question, um, What percentage of your budget, because I can't uh, derive that from this, what percentage of your budget comes from fines? Or where do the fines go? Because it seems how you come after the fines would make it seem as if you needed the money from the fines in order to either function in your agency or to provide some funding back to the city. Is it that you need these fines in order to function? No, the fines go back to the city. They go back to the city? Are they then reallocated to your agency in order to distribute funds? No, they, they go back to the general fund. How much do you, how much in the 2013 did you raise in fines? I'm sorry, I thought I had that number here, but I do not. I'm, I apologize. I'll have to get that for you. I mean, these are the basic questions in terms of things that you would want to know in terms of where does the funding come from, where does it go, how much does it actually raise? I had that number, I just, it did not, I, I just, okay. we, we repay those fines, uh, we give the money back on a quarterly basis to the city. But you have no idea how much it is, is it, do you raise a million dollars in fines, do you raise a half a million or a quarter of a million, an estimate? It's. A 
I'm sorry, I actually have it in an email, but I didn't bring my phone up <laughs> with me. But I'll, I'll get it for you. I mean, I, I, I don't want to say a number and then just be wrong. I mean, I looked at it yesterday, and you think I'd remember, but I just don't. <laughs> How often do you find that in the fines and the determinations that you're making that in the process of those running for office that it's criminal versus it's uh, an accounting issue, uh, someone made a mistake, maybe they didn't get a proper signature, uh, they took out more cash than they thought that they were allotted accidentally. So there are accidental mistakes, and then there are criminal mistakes. So in the 2013, what percentage of those or how many candidates did you actually find had criminal findings versus accounting or uh, issues around how they were um, documenting their campaign or accounting issues? Well, we don't assess any, I mean, we have no jurisdiction over criminal violations, so we don't actually, none of the findings of the of violation by the board were criminal. Um, all of them are civil penalties. Now, if you're talking about whether they are documentation or not, um, I think it, you know, that again is a matter of, uh, there's a matter of degree. I mean, we have, again, tried to adjust the way we audit and the way we assess penalties to uh, allow that people make mistakes and that when they're informed of those mistakes, if they timely remedy them, that the, you know, they will not be penalized. Uh, but again, that we don't assess, we don't have any criminal. I mean, there are, we do sometimes find there have been over the course of the history of the program, occasions where there are candidates who have been uh, tried to commit fraud or some other activity that would be Do you find criminal, that to be and we would refer <clears throat> that to a criminal prosecutor for prosecution. Do you know how often that happens? It's a, that is that kind of criminal act, fraud activity is relatively rare. I mean, only a handful over the course of a thirty-year. Oh. Ten, twenty. I mean, that's interesting to note because I, I just want to, for like, let's say, for example, myself. So one of the challenges, I would almost find it very difficult to encourage someone to run for office the way this system is currently set up, because anything could happen to you when you go in, even with the best of intentions. So as you know, with, with my situation, right out the gate, I was fined $17,000 for a technicality, right, in terms of you all assessed that um, a consultant that we used utilized a, um, had a special interest group as a client and also had me as a client, and the special interest group did an independent expenditure in my race, and because my, uh, person who was managing the campaign, the consulting group, was managing me and the special interest group, which I had no knowledge of, you all fined me $17,000, right? So then I was able to then hire a lawyer who was able to bring that $17,000 down to $7,000, and of course his fee was $10,000, right? So I wind up having to pay $17,000 right out the gate as, as a brand new candidate. So what that means is that that takes time away because now I, I owe $17,000 as soon as I come into office. So now I gotta start doing fundraisers. I gotta do a birthday party. I gotta do an Easter party. I gotta do a spring fling. I gotta do all this stuff. And that takes away from my ability to be an effective legislator over a technicality. So for me, I don't come from a wealthy family. They had given all that they could give my friends, my, 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 my supporters. Now I have to pay $17,000, and I didn't even get my audit back yet. So when I get the audit, that's another $68,000 fine, which I'm then able to hire another lawyer for $20,000 to get the fine back down to $8,000. So it's like it's all this thing where you're trying to realize your campaign promises to your community, but you have to deal with the CFB all day long with having to raise money to pay back all these fines. And as soon as I pay them down, I just, after five years, have paid all my fines and everybody back and all this stuff. Now I, I, I had to get ready to, to raise money to run for office again. It's like a very vicious cycle, and, and, and I'll be honest, I don't know an elected official that's here that's not dealing with that in some way, shape, form, or fashion. So it's, 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 
you know, the public may see, oh, it's great being an elected official, oh, it's this, it's that. They don't realize the internal workings of how this system is taking them away from the very work that they're looking to do. So I'll just conclude on that. I would appreciate a lot of those answers because I feel that, in my estimation, we are hurting, and as a woman candidate, it's very difficult for me to go out and tell women who are mothers, who have children, who have all these different dynamics to go going on, go ahead and run for office. But if you lose, you might have to take your baby's milk money to pay back the fines that you owe because that's gonna be the reality for you. So I'll just conclude at that and I, and I do look forward to getting the information. Thank you. Uh, let me just uh, echo what our majority leader uh, have uh, expressed. I think uh, perhaps what we need to do is look at uh, some of the excessive penalties. I, I do agree people who are, you know, doing criminal acts, uh, we should uh, put forth the full extent of the law. But uh, you mentioned that 18% 18, 18 of the candidates didn't participate, adding those who didn't qualify, love to see the percentage there. But you're right, I mean, for most uh, people who have ever run, this is grueling. This is very, a very painful experience. And I have some of my colleagues that said, I'm raising money to avoid uh, going through uh, you know, CFB. And I, you know, it's, it's painful to hear that as well because I don't think that was the original intention of the law. I have my own experiences. Um, that are, you know, traumatic at times, yeah. uh, to say the least, uh, because it, it takes away your focus. I, I do believe that there are people out there, let me just be straight out, they want to cheat the system, they want to cheat trying to get the ways in there, but most candidates, I, I, you know, that's not their intention, and sometimes because an address was missing, a uh, part of the address, or a little super technical thing, and it's just it's super annoying. Uh, and you have to pay a treasurer, you know, some of the candidates had to do that. It's just overwhelming. You can see the level of frustration. Um, and I don't want to get into too many specifics here, because this is not what this hearing is about, but please go back recheck how you do this penalty uh, setting, what criteria we're using for those uh, penalties, you know, uh, how do we justify those penalties, uh, will be something that we'll look to hear uh, later on in a, a future uh, hearing. I'll turn it back to, to the co-chair. Well, thank you, and I'd say here, here to what, what uh, both of these council members have just stated, and actually, you know, I would not be in elective office if it wasn't for um, the campaign finance system that we have, and I'm very grateful for that. Um, but I have to tell you, you've actually created a whole new profession, which is campaign finance attorneys, who uh, we pay a tremendous amount of money just so we don't get caught into that web of insanity that oftentimes some of the candidates have found themselves going through. So I think we need to look at that more thoroughly uh, because seriously, this is an issue. Uh, but let me just ask, what is the maximum amount that a campaign can spend on a compliance attorney? There is no, ma I mean, they, the maximum is the spending limit. I mean, there's, is no, what? there's, no, there's no particular uh, maximum that a candidate can spend well, on any so, one thing. Okay. But the, they can, I mean, they can, they, the, it's just the spending limit. So I know candidates that are spending thirty-five, forty thousand dollars just on 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 in compliance attorneys to get through a campaign cycle, and um, and so we're not exaggerating in, in that sense. And I'm wondering, do you have any numbers on what people are spending for compliance attorneys? Um, I mean, we can look at that. I mean, we have. It's reported in s several different ways by different candidates, so it's a, a little more complicated than just you know, pulling a number. I think that would, that would give us an idea of um, you know what, what both of these council members are um, speaking to, is this great expense and this um, idea, this need to protect yourself even when you're not trying to do anything wrong. Again, we have a full staff of our 
candidate services and audit staff who are there to help people who are new candidates uh, to navigate the program. And we also do, again, of course, reserve the most serious penalties for the most serious offenses. They may not be criminal offenses, but, director but they Lopez, you know, uh, Lopez, you're absolutely right, and I think the system has gotten better. Uh, and I think that this new system where you look at each disclosure period is good. However, I would never go into a campaign without having a compliance attorney look at everything that I submit. And I think that's what we're alluding to, is that that issue is a real issue for anybody who's going to run for office. You have to factor into your, your campaign expenditures these, these compliance attorneys. Anyway. Thank you. thank you. All right, thank you for coming in. And uh, we're going to now go to the uh, next section of this hearing with um, the Law Department. Okay, uh, we will now uh, resume the City Council's hearing on the Mayor's Executive Budget for Fiscal 19. The Finance Committee is joined by the Committee on Governmental Operations, chaired by Councilmember Fernando Cabrera, um, and we are the only council members here. So I'm going to forego my opening statement. We welcome uh, Corporation Council Zachary Carter, to, who's here to join us, and I believe that Councilmember Cabrera is also going to forego his opening statement. Absolutely. And therefore, we're going to ask council to swear in the panel. And then, um, uh, Mr. C Mr. Carter, you can start with your testimony as soon as she swears you in. Certainly. You affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief. I do. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Drum, Chair Guerrera, uh, and distinguished members of the Finance and Government Operations Committee. I am pleased to appear before you to discuss the Law Department's fiscal year 2019 executive budget. Uh, the Law Department consists of 16 legal and three support divisions. Uh, we handle an extraordinary array of cases and non-litigation matters, from tort to tax, from environmental and administrative issues to economic development and municipal finance. Uh, we also represent the city as plaintiff in a wide variety of affirmative matters. The executive budget contains funds to support implementation of phase one of the New York State's Raise the Age legislation in New York City. The law increases the age of criminal responsibility in New York State to 16 years old as of October 1, 2018, and to 17 years old on October 1, 2019. The family court system is focused on rehabilitation. The law department, through its family court division, seeks to ensure that those youth who commit delinquent acts are held accountable for their misconduct 
and receive appropriate services. In making adjudication recommendations to the family court, the Law Department seeks to balance the need for protection of the community with the needs and the best interests of the youth. The Department is working intensely to prepare for both the legal and logistical challenges to the juvenile delinquency practice in the New York City family courts, as well as an expected rise in case volumes. It is important that during this implementation, our family court division remain focused on our current youth population, as well as ensuring that older youth receive rehabilitative services in a manner consistent with community safety. In light of the anticipated volume, our family court division is restructuring to develop an expanded and stronger central management team and has created new supervisory positions in specialized areas of the practice, including the major case unit, which handles our most serious and violent cases, and the special victims unit, which handles sex offenses. In addition to internal preparations, the Family Court Division has been actively participating in both citywide and borough-based working groups and task forces, focusing on various implementation issues, including court processes, data analytics, and risk assessment, programming, diversion, and facilities. Our Family Court Administration team has been collaborating with the five district attorney's offices to ensure smooth transfer and removal of adolescent offender cases to family court. Our director of Raise the Age Strategy and Planning recently conducted training alongside the Manhattan District Attorney's Office at the New York Prosecutors Training Institute Metro Conference for approximately 200 local ADAs and prosecutors, and we are planning joint trainings with the District Attorney's Office in all counties for this fall. The executive budget also contains funds for particular case-related needs which are largely electronic discovery and expert services. Further, the budget for the, uh, for the 2018 Charter Revision resides within the Law Department's budget. Uh, in conclusion, I thank you for your support of the Law Department and look forward to your, uh, co our continued working together. Uh, I would be happy to answer any of your questions. Okay, thank you, Mr. Carter. Certainly. And um, uh, let me just talk a little bit about Raise the Age. 32.2, uh, excuse me, $32.2 million and 254 positions were added to the Law Department's fiscal 19 budget to implement the first stage of Raise the Age. Can you explain what this $32.2 million is going to pay for? Uh, certainly. Um, in the main, it's, it's for uh, personnel cost, uh, the addition of both assistant district, uh, I'm sorry, assistant corporation counsel uh, to the family court division and complementary uh, support staff, uh, as well as um, uh, administrative uh, positions that have to support uh, the new infrastructure that will be necessary uh, to take on uh, this um, very large additional case uh, load. It's anticipated that cases that formerly would have been prosecuted by the five DAs of 16 to 17 year olds uh, will, consist, will actually double in phase one and triple uh, in phase uh, three. And that's, and that's uh, in, in general terms uh, what the, uh, the additional resources will be used to, to manage. So what type of interaction are you going to be having now uh, with the youth courts and the, uh, the court diversion programs? Do you, Angela, do you want to answer that? Do you mean yeah. the adolescent diversion parts mm -hmm. that are in criminal court? Uh, at this point, we don't know, but I think we can certainly ask OCA and get back to you on that point. Okay, I appreciate that. Um, a deep believer in those uh, diversion programs, so um, it's important. Is there a net cost to implementation of Raise the Age? And um, why is this not a one-to-one -one transfer from one agency uh, to the other previously doing the work? So is there a savings to the other agencies that could have been transferred over to you? That is, that is a, a budget issue, I think, that would be better directed to, uh, to OMB. Uh, that, that is, um, I don't think that we are in a position to answer that on, on behalf of the city. Okay, we're going to follow up with OMB on that because that was something I didn't get to ask OMB in the initial hearings, uh, but would really like to know and have an answer on that as well. Um, the executive plan adds new funding of 1.5 million and 17 new positions to the headcount in fiscal 19 
to finance the work of the Mayor's Charter uh, Commission. Of this funding, $1 million is allocated for personnel services, and the remaining $500,000 is allocated for other than personnel services. Um, can you briefly explain uh, or outline what this funding will be spent on? Well, uh, generally speaking, uh, this will be um, uh, for personal services, that is 17 uh, staff, uh, and other than personal services, which include stenographers and uh, translators. Uh, the operational uh, control of the Charter Commission rests with the Commission itself and its staff. Uh, they are hosted on our budget platform, but, uh, the, but we uh, do not have uh, operational control of that process. So what is the, our role, the Law Department's role, in terms of working with the Charter Commission? Uh, supplying resources and staff. Okay. Are there any other agencies that you'll be working with? In connection with the Charter Commission? Yeah. They'll have access to all the agencies of government because in the course of their inquiries, they're going to need information from all the agencies of government. So they'll be interacting with almost all or with all of them. Absolutely. Okay, now uh, just some questions on units of appropriation. Despite being composed of 16 legal divisions and four support divisions, the Law Department's budget has only two U of A's, personnel services and other than personnel. In the preliminary budget response, the council called on the administration to create a U of A pair for the tort division, which is the law department's largest. Uh, this was not done. In previous hearings, you have opposed creating a U of A for each of your divisions, as this would constrain the transfer of resources across divisions, which you do often. Would separating the tort division's budget from the rest of the law department impose similar constraints on you? Uh, yes, it would. Uh, the um, cases that are brought uh, uh, and that are managed by the tort, the prosecuted, or, or sorry, rather, rather defended uh, by the tort division vary in size and complexity. Um, there could be a case uh, that is a class action or a, or, or a, a suit for uh, affirmative belief that will require uh, a huge influx of resources. Uh, there could be a case that involves uh, a, a, a personal injury uh, that could have medical claims. Um, it's, it's, very, it's hard to anticipate when there will be that kind of blockbuster case that requires us to be able to flexibly shift resources even across uh, the division and across borough offices. Uh, I mean, our, tort, our tort division um, has to be the largest in the country. Any one of our tort offices in any of the four largest boroughs would be a corporation council's office unto itself uh, in some other jurisdictions. So, so we need uh, tremendous flexibility in being able to transfer, and, uh, transfer resources. How often in general do you do that transfer of resources? Is there an average number of times that you need to do that? Well, it's, it's pretty constant. I, th I think that, that, that our chief administration, uh, Mal Higgins, can, uh, can may perhaps explain it more precisely. Um, but I think that uh, OMB, uh, in terms of responsibly managing the cash of the city, um, sometimes ex uh, uh, provides money to us on an as-needed basis um, uh, so that uh, they're, they're certain that allocated monies uh, get uh, get expeditiously uh, spent and no more than necessary to uh, to meet an objective and, and consequently uh, the the fact that we uh, that we have uh, um, uh, this, this these two broad units of, of, of uh, 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 these two broad units makes it easier for us to manage uh, to be quite do you have anything that you want to add now okay. so in which direction do they usually flow do they go? From tort to other divisions, how does that work? Within the uh, the tort division, occasionally there may be transfers uh, uh, across divisions to um, perhaps special fed on occasion. Um, also with support staff, which I think um, Al may be in a better position to. Well, we have <coughs> 16 legal divisions, and <coughs> those legal divisions uh, will have different kinds of caseloads and OTPS needs. So money is flowing back and forth from each of those divisions, from the tort division out to commercial litigation to different divisions. And there's a limited amount of money that we're moving on an as-needed basis. So we have a structural deficit that we start with. So the flexibility to be able to move that money 
on a weekly basis from, from one division who has a, a particular case that's now kind of exploded from another case that might have gone a bit dormant, we'll move the money over, and that happens weekly. Weekly? Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, that, that often. Um, has OMB spoken to you about a little bit more transparency in terms of U of A's on this? Uh, no. Okay, because they have spoken to other agencies, um, and I'm just curious why they have not spoken with you. Well, I, th I think that's because they understand uh, that each agency is unique. Uh, and has unique needs for flexibility in, in allocation of resources. I'm sure you, I, I'm probably, I'm, I, you know, it's been a priority for the council that we get more transparency in the budget, mm -hmm. and that's what we're trying to aim at here, is to find out uh, a little bit more about when and why and how these transfers are needed. So um, I would still like to continue that discussion about this uh, moving forward. Uh, even though you may not be prepared right now to discuss that, but definitely it's our role as council members to be able to track that funding. Sure. So that's that's our objective here. And, and, and certainly, even outside the context of units of appropriation, we'd welcome any inquiries you have about how we uh, deploy uh, resources, because a formal unit of all allocation isn't necessary uh, for us to be able to answer your, uh, your inquiries mm -hmm. uh, in terms of how we uh, expend our resources. All right, let's talk a little bit about judgments and claims and the payouts. They've grown under the de Blasio administration from an annual average of 500, uh, 584.9 million between fiscal 10 and 13 to an average of 720.5 million between 2014 and 17. Could you briefly explain why this upward trend is happening? All right, first of all, you know, it, you know as, as we've um, um, stated on prior occasions, judgment and claims uh, are going to vary from year to year because these cases are so uh, long in the system. Uh, so even though, you know, as you pointed out, a, a certain trending um, that you characterize as having occurred in this administration, these are in cases that were filed long before the onset of this administration, in cases that, um, that have been uh, fiercely litigated uh, over a period of years and that only during the course of this administration were, uh, were finally resolved. Uh, and that's gonna vary from year to year. And while there are um, cases uh, that, um, are settled for tens of millions of dollars. Uh, there are many more cases that are e that are being uh, successfully uh, defended uh, that represent equivalent uh, uh, levels of of, uh, of dollars. I mean, as a result, and we'll talk about later about about verticalization. Uh, we believe that uh, cases that have not been filed as a result of it being clear to uh, plaintiffs' bar that we are capable. Uh, of mounting a robust defense of any cases that we regard as frivolous, we've avoided the payment of some $48 million in claims. Um, but there are certain categories of cases uh, that kind of create a new reality for us. And the, uh, and the, and the most prominent in, in that, uh, of, of those uh, categories is wrongful convictions. Um, for all, I, what I consider to be, particularly as a, as, a, as a veteran former prosecutor, for all the best reasons, um, all of the DA's offices now have um, a conviction integrity unit or the equivalent thereof uh, to entertain um, applications to uh, re-examine uh, uh, cases in which there may have been uh, a mistaken conviction. And these are resulting in convictions be, uh, being overturned um, and, uh, uh, and claims against the city um, in connection with, uh, with those wrongful convictions. And when you and when you consider um, uh, that most of these uh, claims are resolved uh, at a and I hate to say a going rate in terms of a person's life, but on average uh, about a, ha a half million dollars a year uh, in connection with uh, with these claims, then for someone who's been uh, incarcerated for you know a decade or more, it adds up to a substantial uh, uh, recovery. Central Park Five was in that, in that in category that money as that's well, correct. right? 
Um, approximately how much of the payouts are from cases defended by the law department versus uh, notices of claim settled by the controller? I don't have the percentage. But we, would, we would have to get that information from the controller so that we would have the total picture. Okay, what are the other uh, major sources of judgment and claims uh, payouts? Uh, Health and Hospitals Corporation. Uh, in those cases, the law department does not defend. Uh, that those are, are uh, um, uh, defended by uh, uh, MedMal uh, um, uh, practice firms. So in the fiscal 18, uh, judgment and claims budget grew by 20 million in the executive plan from uh, 691.6 to 711.6 million. Can you explain that growth to us? Again, they were, that was largely because of uh, a handful of very large uh, recoveries. Um, fiscal 18 included uh, the um, long-standing litigation in connection with uh, summonses. Uh, it was a class action in which the recovery was $26 million, uh, in which there were thousands of individual claims that just added up to this uh, a very large sum. Uh, there was one wrongful eviction case, um, you know, Kings County DA's office, um, Hatchet Lopez, which was tw settled for $20.5 million. Um, the uh, employment uh, discrimination action in connection with F FDNY. Um, actually, oh, is that, the, is that the Roque case? That's the Roque case. All right, that, 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 that was actually was a, a personal injury uh, case in connection with a fire tragedy. Um, uh, uh, known as the Skolowski case, which was filed in 2004, um, and uh, that was a, a $29.5 million judgment. Um, a roadway design uh, litigation uh, that resulted in a judgment of $22 million. Uh, and then there were a, a, a group of uh, wrongful conviction cases arising out of arrests that occurred back in 1992 um, that um, added up to uh, approximately $26 million. Thank you. Um, can you explain your methodology for arriving at a, a budget estimate for, um, for claims, for judgment and claims? Well, actually, OMB uh, comes up with the calculation because the judgment and claims takes into account not only law department um, uh, uh, litigated cases, but again, as you pointed out, H&H. Uh, &H, um, uh, but do you feed them information about cases that are coming up that you think you're going to have to settle that gives them an estimate about what those settlements might be? Yes, we do. You do? Yes. So then you know what's in the pike, what's coming up? Yes, we do. Um, in the preliminary budget response, we call for an increase in vertical case handling to help mitigate this growth, yes. uh, yet this was not included in the executive plan. Do you think expanding vertical case handling could reduce judgment and claim payouts in the future? I, I think vertical handling uh, of litigation cases is always the ideal. It is, w whether it's in criminal practice, high volume practice, or in civil high volume practice, it's the way uh, that our uh, lawyers uh, get best prepared in a case uh, because they become familiar with it from its inception uh, until it's finally uh, resolved. Uh, and the more knowledgeable we are about uh, the case early on, uh, the quicker we can um, file a, a dispositive motion in the case for it to be uh, dismissed or prepare ourselves uh, sufficiently for trial quickly enough that our adversaries are impressed with our resolve and either settle on, on, um, on favorable terms or the case goes to trial. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna go to Chair uh, Cabrera now. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, let me uh, go back to race to age staffing. Uh, when will you, do you estimate uh, these positions uh, will start getting filled and, by, and how many by October the 1st. Yeah. I'm going to let uh, the, the, the chief of our family court division. I'm sorry, the, the, the 
dispositions, when do they start? I didn't understand the question. Yeah, the, all of the race, uh, uh, race to age positions. Mm -hmm. Oh, the uh, positions, I'm sorry. Yeah. We're filling them now. It's ongoing. We're doing hiring. We have some, we have 35 lawyers coming on board um, in August for uh, the new class. We have uh, lateral interviewing going on right now. We're making offers to people. We have management positions posted. We're in the process of doing those interviews. So we're hoping to get as many people on board for phase one um, prior to October 1st. So that on October 1st, we're, we're you know, very, very ready. So what do you estimate, uh, how many positions will be filled by October 1st? I believe it's gonna be close to 200. 200? Approximately. Approximately, would that be enough? Possibly more. If it's 200, would that be enough for you to handle the caseloads that are coming your way? Uh at no, we, we need more than that, but we're aware that the hiring process doesn't always work as, as fast as we like it to. So we are in the process of hiring now. We're doing multiple interviews every day. We have multiple teams of people doing interviews. So when I say that we'll have approximately 200, I'm being realistic about the hiring process. Right. Um, and so um, we'd love to have everybody on board October 1st, and we'll certainly shoot for that goal. Um, but I do have to be realistic and know that things do get you know slow, and we we may want to hire people who aren't able to give notice or you know who can't leave their current job right away, and so we may wait for those people to come on board. So we're expecting some delays, but overall we're going to be ready on October 1st to implement Raise the Age. Yeah, I appreciate uh, that there's a lot of people to hire in a very short amount of time. When I was the chair of Juvenile Justice, I was sending the alarm very early on that, uh, first of all, dealing with the state, you know, giving us the regs and, um, and, and you know, how everything was going to structure and the systems are going to be t uh, put in place. Um, and now you kind of be put in a, you're put in a predicament that you have to hire a whole lot of people very quickly. And then with that, it's not just hiring, it comes to training, uh, with that, mm -hmm. establishing culture and, mm -hmm. and, and being able to download the DNA that you have already. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so um, it, my, my concern, and again, you heard how sympathetic I am and, and super understanding is that we'll be able to make a good transition you know, with October 1st, I, in light of everything else that I, that are all the moving parts that I, I'm still having my, uh, the, you know, I'm a very optimistic person, but there's a pessimistic part of me that says October 1st, just not everything is gonna be put in place. So I appreciate uh, all the efforts that you could put forth uh, and, and really and hire as many people as possible. I want to move uh, quickly to, you know, we, we, we heard earlier uh, uh, from the commissioner from DCAS, and I asked a question regarding uh, the possibility of installing cameras uh, in, the, in uh, the city vehicles, uh, whether it's sanitation, whether it's police cars, um, because sometimes people claim that, that they were injured by a vehicle and uh, or whatever other circumstance uh, uh, related to a vehicle that was not true. Uh, it takes a, a vast amount of your um, workers' power that you have, council power, to investigate all that. There's, there's nothing like video cameras. I, I'm a firm believer in video cameras. I, I have placed more video cameras. Uh, police uh, uh, cameras in my district than any other district for partly for for the very reason the premise that I'm, I'm bringing forth this question so my question to you is do you would you advise uh, DCAS uh, to have uh, vehicle cameras that you know place forward in case of an accident. Well, what I, I certainly think is is reasonable, and and I, and I know that that sometimes an answer that that in, that includes the word study uh, can be misconstrued as delay, <laughs> but I, I but I really mean it, mean it uh, <clears throat> when I say that it is that the technology um, that is required would have to be, and I think this can be done ex relatively expeditiously, would be carefully enough studied 
that you know that you'd be capturing the kind of images that you need to capture. As, as you asked the question, I was visualizing sitting in my car and looking at the backup and, you know, uh, assisted cameras that I have just to help me park. Right. And just thinking about what that would look like if it were being recorded and would it t show me everything I'd need to show if there was a collision. If there was a collision, maybe if I'm turning left, it's, it's gonna, they're, they're gonna, there may be blind spots. I mean, even with body-worn cameras, there was a tremendous amount of testing to determine where the cameras should be placed on an officer's uniform in order to capture mm. uh, most of the action in front of them. So it's, it's, I, th I think it's a great suggestion. Anything that can help provide a neutral, objective, evidentiary record is good for us. It's good for us. It's good for citizens if it turns out that they have a valid claim against the city. It's good for the city when it turns out it's not a, a valid claim. So it's, it's definitely worth investigating, but I think we need to, to get a, a handle on what the technology is available and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, how, and what's the best technology to accomplish what you're suggesting. Well, anything that we could be of help to that end, uh, please, um, we, we, we'll be more than glad to be helpful. I mean, that might be something that should be included in, in, uh, in this go around in the budget. Uh, to to have you know to fund a study uh, so we could do it right we want to do it right the first time around so we're not buying you know the wrong kind of equipment uh, and I know this is storage issue there's other expenses that come with this a lot of these cameras you could set it that they record for an entire month if you have no use for them they you know they just start re-recording uh, again. But again, that will be for the professionals uh, to analyze. I wanted to move on quickly to lawsuit, the lawsuits that you have against the big pharmaceuticals and big oil. Uh, any update from uh, the last time uh, that we had uh, a hearing? I don't think there's Anything's any, changed there, since there then? There hasn't been any, any significant litigation event okay. um, since the last time uh, we, uh, we uh, said anything publicly about the case. And um, the executive uh, plan, uh, I'm going to focus now on my last question on case-specific new needs, uh, includes an additional $8.5 million for case-specific new needs for fiscal 2018 on top of the $14.5 million in case-specific new needs added to your fiscal 2018 budget in the November and preliminary uh, plans. Uh, so can you give us... Uh, uh, some more details as to what this new funding is allocated for. Would this 8.5 million be sufficient, or should we expect there to be additional case-specific new needs funding added to the budget before adoption? Um, why does this funding grow across the fiscal year? And attached to that, I'm just putting it all together uh, here for you. In fiscal 2017, you had an N of uh, end of year surplus of 3.9 million. Was this an OTPS or PS surplus? Okay. I know I just gave you a, a low, low fold, but you, sure, sure, you're, sure. you're a lawyer. You, you guys are used to getting well, the, the multiple largest, questions. Right, sure. The, the largest component of uh, the 8.5 million is uh, in uh, the area of e discovery and experts. Uh, and as, as you may know, the, probably the most expensive um, component of meeting our discovery obligations involves e-discovery, uh, particularly since the predominant mode of communication within businesses and, 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 and in government is email. Uh, and compiling uh, electronic communications, sorting them for relevant materials um, is expensive. Um, and, uh, and so gearing up for that, um, along with engaging uh, experts, um, is, is one of the largest litigation co costs that we, uh, that we bear. So alongside with that, if we consistently need to add new funding in the middle of the fiscal year, should we not just budget uh, for this every year adoption? Why don't we just do it now instead of just coming in the middle of the year? And then on top of that, uh, the, the surplus of 3.9, uh, I, 
Are we using that towards this end or, you know, how we come in the middle of the year, we need more, why not just ask for it now? Do you have a answer? Yeah. The, 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 the bulk of the accrual that occurs is from uh, vacant positions and that accrues as you go. So if you look at the end of a year, June 30th, and you have $4 million in accruals, that was generated. How many people have done interns? That was generated in April, May, June. Um, and in most cases, we will take money, monies like that, and attempt to roll them over into the next year to pay for specific case-related things. Is this something that happens every year? Has this been a pattern? Well, there, there is usually accruals from vacancies. It's exacerbated now because we have a lot of vacancies at the moment. Uh, but typically, it's not that, that, that much money. OK, those are, Mr. Chair, I know it's been a long day. Uh, but we know we have uh, yep. more questions. Uh, Calvin Yeager. Chair. Uh, I'll be very brief, uh, Mr. Carter. You indicated uh, and the executive budget is going to increase uh, the law department's budget for spending on uh, uh, hiring uh, for, uh, for the raise the age plan or implementation thereof. And so given that the, the, the process for this is essentially that Corp Council is now going to be prosecuting, not pro we don't call it prosecuting, but the petitioner in cases that the people were formally prosecuting, do you envision a corresponding, and I know you can't speak for district attorney's offices, but could, do you envision a corresponding uh, less of a need for resources in the five district or the six district attorney's offices? And if so, are you able to speak uh, with specificity whether they need less people, uh, whether they need less funds uh, than they would have since you're now picking up the tab essentially for a lot of those cases? Right, I, I understand, it, but it, it's, it's a question I think is better, better posed to OMB. Um, because in terms of um, the budgeting process, I don't know whether or not um, looking at it on a one-to-one -one, um, personnel resource basis tells the entire story. Um, um, I don't know that um, given economies of scale, for instance, um, being relieved of a certain amount of caseload burden um, is a benefit, but that benefit is limited. Um, so I, I don't know whether or not um, uh, in budgetary terms that it is just a dollar for dollar transfer issue. And that, that, I think that, that uh, a representative from OMB would probably be better uh, uh, in a position to, uh, to, to uh, uh, explain. Are you able to give a guesstimate of how many new cases Corp Council will bring as a result of now prosecuting raise the age cases? I, I, we expect that in phase one, um, uh, beginning October 1st, uh, we can expect a doubling in our caseload with just 16 year olds and then Back. a tripling of our caseload. What, what would that number be in terms of how many cases? I'm sorry. What's, what's that? Current? Approximately to approximately 6,000. And then phase two, you said, would be a triple? And then, and then increase to 9,000. So is it fair to, without, without putting a dollar number on it, but is it fair to say that in a, in a case like that, uh, assuming your numbers would, be, would turn out to be correct, that over the, throughout the city, the six district attorneys would see a corresponding reduction in 3,000 cases a year? You would, you, would expect, you would expect that if you just look at uh, 16 and 17 year olds alone. Uh, that um, does not uh, uh, take into account whether or not there'll be any changes in police behavior in, in, in enforcement. Um, you know, when uh, they, uh, so I, I, I just, I, it's hard for me to, uh, to give an accurate assessment. I also, I, and I understand that these are estimates, but are you able to do, and I, I don't expect you to have it on hand, but are you able to do borough by borough estimates of how those 3,000 new caseload, uh, new cases on your caseload would, would, uh, would divide out throughout the six I think we'd be in attorneys? the position to do that. I don't know if you, do you have the numbers uh, now? Uh, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, 
but we're expecting that Bronx and Brooklyn are gonna be the highest volume boroughs, followed by Manhattan and Queens, which are generally around the same number, and then followed by Staten Island. Um, but And special narcotics at, at the tail end? Or does that not even come into play? For us, it doesn't come into play. In, in, in any drug cases, we just, I, we, I'm not sure how that would come into play, but I think the, the drug numbers are probably relatively low compared to assault, robbery, and, and larceny. Okay. I had a, a quick question, um, uh, and, and I, I just, you know, I want to say at the outset, as I said uh, at, my, at the last hearing, uh, Mr. Carter, that you know, I trust you and, and how you run the Corporation Counsel's Office implicitly. You've done this for a long time. You've run uh, offices uh, of, of greater stature. Um, but we, we not, had a not, little... Not greater. No, of course no. not. No. Um, no, no, I mean, I, no, I mean that. It, it's, it's, uh, no, it, it's, uh, I thought I'd had my last, uh, my last great act as U.S. Attorney. This tops that. All right. Well, okay. then, then uh, this, will, this, this should be an easy one for you. And, and I, again, I defer to your judgment, but I'm just curious to your thinking and how you came about this. Um, we had a little banter about vertical case handling and... Yes whether or not, uh, you know, increasing how you do that um, would, would result in some kind of a savings. And, and I trust you that you came to the conclusion that it wouldn't, and I'm not questioning that at all. I'm just asking how you came to the conclusion that it wouldn't. That it would not? That it would not result in a savings necessary for you to include in the executive budget. Because the executive budget doesn't reflect an additional savings to vertical case handling as suggested by the council and the council's response to the preliminary. Well, I, I, that that may be a misunderstanding. Um, we don't want to. We don't want to um, attribute savings to um, verticalization that we're not fully confident in. But we do know that as a result of the vertical handling in tort and the traditional vertical handling in um, in special fed that there have been cases that in which we have avoided uh, judgments that we approximate in the range of $48 million. So that, that, that's, that's real dollars. Now, it, the calculation of that is based on the demands that were made. We try to um, take into account only demands that we regard to be reasonable in terms of damages, not the extravagant uh, demands that are in, in, in the addendum clause of every new complaint, um, but uh, but taking into account those reasonable demands, we believe that uh, as a result of the reduced filings, um, as uh, because uh, I think there's a, there's an awareness in the plaintiffs' bar uh, that we are uh, probably more capable than we ever have been uh, to uh, fend off. Um, uh, clearly frivolous cases, um, that, th that those cases that aren't brought are resources that we don't have to expend and judgments that we avoid. Yeah, well, I believe that you're capable more than the office has ever been before. Um, uh, is, it fair to, is it fair to say that uh, you're not able to recognize the savings for purposes of the executive budget until you actually implement the verticalization, as you call it? So. You, it's just something you would have to do before you're able to put a dollar that's, number on it. That's correct. That's a fair so, point. So it's not so much necessarily that the the that OMB or Corp Council's office uh, declined to to take our numbers into a budget. It's just that you can't put a price tag on it. That's correct. Okay. That is All correct. All right. Thank you, Mr. Carter. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Thank you very much. I think that's it for this uh, hearing. Thank, thank you. you very much for coming in and appreciate your testimony. Our pleasure. I'm going to close this out by saying. That this concludes our hearing for today. The Finance Committee will resume executive budget hearings for fiscal 27, uh, fiscal 19, tomorrow, Friday, May 18th at 8, at 10 a.m. Uh, in the chambers. Tomorrow, the Finance Committee will hear from the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, the three library systems, and the Department of Cultural Affairs. As a reminder, the public will be invited to testify on Thursday, May 24th, the last day of budget hearings at approximately 4 p.m. in this room, or actually in the chambers. For any member of the public who wishes to testify but cannot make it to the hearing, you can email your testimony to the Finance Division at financetestimony at council.nyc.gov, and the staff will make it part of the official record, and this hearing is now officially adjourned. Good job. Thank you. Thank you.